morning. I must say it's uh, really nice to be here in Rotorua. I have not been to this part of New Zealand before. Uh, it has a lot going for it. I think one of the really nice things about it is that you can pass wind in public and never have to feel guilty. <laughs> um, oh, I've got a screen here, good. Okay. Um, Uh, this is a bit of a timeline. I mean, I'll be covering a bit of the same territory that Jeff's covered. The timeline uh, of the spread of myrtle rust uh, in Australia. I'm taking a Victorian perspective, and that's where I come from. Um, I've had spent some time in the tropical areas looking at leptospermum in particular. Uh, but um, my main area in, term, in terms of running a nursery is in Victoria. So I can talk about that um, more specifically, which of course, as you'd realise, is a different climatic zone to the tropics uh, in northern New South Wales and Queensland. Mm -hmm. um, in November 2013, I stumbled across this one day in Colac, west of Melbourne. Uh, it's not myrtle rust, it's uh, it's uh, another, another beast, uh, Macrocarpa cypress. And uh, this particular uh, infection was first discovered in Monterey in California in 1927, um, arrived in New Zealand in 1933, uh, arrived in Australia in 1948, and now, now is occupied just about everywhere in the temperate part of the rest of the world. And you can go out and look at a tree at four o'clock, four o'clock in the afternoon, come back the next day and it'll be completely infected. Um, and it's terminal, they do not recover. And that spread from um, an area west of Melbourne through to well into South Australia, a distance of many hundreds of kilometres in a week. And it was terrifying. And I looked at that and I thought, well, if myrtle rust is going to be anything like this, then uh, we're facing an Armageddon given the importance of Metacea in the Australian landscape. Um, we're going to be wiped out. And that was the feeling uh, at the time that this horrible disease is going to come to Australia. We're going to be, have all of our plantation timber industries wiped out. Everything is just going to be total, total destruction. And I suspect that there's a bit of that kind of feeling in New Zealand at the moment. And um, that this could be really, really serious indeed. It, you know, I'm not going to downplay the potential of it. But the experience, in, certainly in the temperate parts of Australia, has turned out to be quite different. But that was one of the predictive models that started this hysteria uh, back in uh, 2010. Focus on the really bright red bits, because this predictive model was based on climate and various other factors. And it take a particular look at the nor North Island of New Zealand, and you can see why there's a potential for a bit of uh, a bit of panic about that compared to the South Island. Forget the orange, forget the yellow. It's the red stuff. Um, you can see also it, that uh, in the um, area between the lower coastal areas of Queensland and up further north, there's an area of dry tropics where it's not quite so prevalent or not so quite much of a risk. Um, Jeff had the slide, so we're seeing it again. Uh, I might add too that that is not continuous all the way up and down the coast, with varying degrees of severity. And you'll notice too that um, it's spreading, it says it's spreading into Victoria. This is another, mo another bit of modelling showing um, that uh, the, the one on the right is the susceptibility to, um, uh, sorry, the density of mutation in the, in the environment and uh, the, the, the one on the left is uh, the climatic suitability modelling. All this goes back to 2010 and it really hasn't panned out quite that way at this stage. Um, now in Victoria, um, the, uh, the, the uh, incursion of myrtle rust was discovered, first discovered in November 2011, which is a particularly humid, warm time of year in Melbourne. It's quite unpleasant. Um, and uh, it, it found its way into the Melbourne metropolitan area in nursery stock that came from northern New South Wales in a large semi-trailer, 
curtisides on it and it was distributed to a chain of um, hardware slash uh, nursery outlets throughout Melbourne uh, by a company with a red and green colour scheme, which I won't mention the name of, which I believe is in Auckland as well. Um, and uh, they, were, they jumped on it pretty quickly when they found out what had happened and the DPI claimed that they disinfected the outbreak. I, I don't know whether they did or not because it died out pretty quickly, but you can see looking at the diagram up there, the picture, that it found its way, customers buying plants, found its way into regional centres in Victoria and again, it infected other plants in the garden, family Metasia, um, and uh, it, it was wiped out. But again, I, I'm not sure whether it was the climate that did it or, or, or the copper-based um, copper fungicides that were sprayed everywhere to try and control it. But going back before then, in 2008, um, before myrtle rust was found in New South Wales, Plant Health Australia assessed myrtle rust as having predictably, high potential to enter Australia, high potential to establishment, high to extreme potential to spread, all those things have basically come true. And continuing down with these other bullet points, which I don't need to read out. Now, the, the, um, the, the industry was very quick, to re very quick to respond. The government, all these, um, uh, all these uh, phyto, um, phyto security um, processes were put in place and uh, by 2012, after that Melbourne Victorian outbreak, um, the business that I have I could clearly see there was going to be a big risk and a big issue in all this. We went and sought accreditation to deal with it. We, we did a, all, the staff, whoops, all the staff did a course. We, uh, we got the formal ICA 42 accreditation, which has allowed us to take uh, plant material into state. 99% of what we do is Mertasia, forest seedlings, leptospermum and so on. So, but there are now, there are now, hmm, what have I done? There are now uh, two and a half thousand people in the nursery industry in Victoria alone that have, uh, have accreditation to identify, to deal with a potential myrtle rust outbreak. Um, ICA 42 is a, another level up from that. So that's been fairly responsive. We, as you can see, I did my certificate there in, in uh, 2012, and away we go. Now that involved having policies on, on uh, all sorts of things to do with, um, to do with plant hygiene, nursery hygiene and so on. We, we, for example, we don't allow people to bring plant material onto the property. If they buy plant material and they decide they don't want to use it, it's not allowed to come back. All sorts of stuff like that. And although we haven't had, as Jeff pointed out, an outbreak of myrtle rust in Victoria for some years, there's been no reported outbreak of myrtle rust in the, in the natural environment since 2010 or forever for that matter. So. Um, we're hoping it stays that way. We can speculate on the reasons why that's happened, but it's not, not getting into the blue gum plantations or anything like that at this stage. We've put up signs everywhere, uh, quite stringent security. Nobody's allowed to walk around unescorted or, or at all. All sorts of stuff. We've got a, a, a plant hygiene policy stuck on the front door. Anybody that walks in reads it. Uh, so we're taking this very, very seriously indeed. And I think when you look at the, the spread of myrtle rust in Australia, and I suspect to some extent in, in New Zealand, um, apart from the initial incursion from the cyclone, the, the, the back end of the cyclone, uh, Debbie, that um, uh, this, the main uh, method of transmission appears to be in... Um, uh, coming by, by the nursery process where the conditions are perfect for the uh, multiplication of the uh, infection. <coughs> A couple of quick things I'll, I'll race through because time, 15 minutes goes very quickly I've noticed. They're the main species that were found in Victoria either directly infected or became subsequently affected once those nursery plants arrived and were distributed to retail customers. 
I, I'd imagine it wouldn't be impossible to put even heavier restrictions on heavier restrictions on uh, the sale of these plants at the, at the retail level. I noticed that the comments were made about that earlier, but I think that we've been far, in Australia at least, we're far too soft on allowing these plants to be tra transported around the country without having proper precautions put into it. And the attitude of the nursery industry in Australia, 99% of it's very good, but this, here's an example of a friend of mine up on the Atherton Tableland in North Queensland, bought some plants in the nursery in Cairns, brought them home, it was lily pilly, dwarf lily pillies, Acmena, Smithii. Uh, a couple of weeks later, he noticed they were all covered in this orange uh, fungus. He rang, up the, uh, he rang up the nursery and said, what's going on? He said, oh, it's only myrtle rust, don't worry about it. Cut off, the cut off the branches, cut off the branches and burn them and you'll be right. You know? um, and all sorts of stuff there. None of it, nothing else has been contaminated. We've been planting leptospermes up there to, to watch how the other ones, the local ones, four or five of them, uh, on this property. Uh, none of those have become infected. But I'm damn sure the spores are still there, waiting for all the planets to align and the way it'll go again. Hope, hopefully not, but that's what I'm suggesting might happen. Um, how do we deal with this? There's reference, reference made to Brazil a moment ago. In, uh, in Brazil, they have a huge, massive um, uh, eucalypt-based pulp and paper industry, uh, Ara um, Cruz, and it's in that area of Brazil where myrtle rust originated in the southeast of the country. And very early in the piece, they consulted the CSIRO in Australia to get advice on eucalypts and things. And uh, they now uh, do all of their propagation clonally, that is, they produce cuttings because the, the, the labour is very cheap, and uh, away, away they go. Um, they very early in the piece did some selection work on eucalyptus grandis to find clones that were rust resistant, and that industry has managed to survive as a consequence of that. Yeah. Uh, Coming, coming back to uh, this part of the world, um, scientists are saying now that this might go down, go down to um, uh, much colder temperatures and much higher altitudes as it, as it mutates and evolves, which is a bit of concern to us in Victoria and Tasmania, and as, as it would be on the South Island, one would think. But we've heard all sorts of stories like this in the past that haven't eventuated, so, you yeah. know. Well, well, the jury's out on that quite clearly. It's already self-explanatory. Um, there's a body of scientific opinion that says we should be uh, slowing the spread of murder rust uh, by the use of relatively low-cost phytosanitary precautions. And I would, I would add to that strengthening the responsibility that nurseries have in controlling this problem and the development and deployment, which Jeff talked about, of, of resistant, client, uh, resistant uh, plant, plant stock, not necessarily clones, but selected, screened plantings. How much time have I got left? Very little. Uh, I wanted to talk about our breeding program, but um, I'll do that privately with anybody that's interested. We'll simply not going to do the uh, not going to be able to do that in in, it, in its complete form, um, so I might uh, just put that in advance. If anybody's interested, I have all the information for here about that. And we're down to 58 seconds. Thank you very much. Oh no, thank you.